welcome to the Weekly Artifact. I'm Justin, and this is my co-host. Hi, I'm Alex. We're two former creative writing majors searching for meaning in a sea of content. Every other week, we'll select one piece of content each, an article, a video, another podcast, that we found particularly interesting and discuss it. As always, our comments are our own and are not associated with any institution. The show may contain explicit language or themes. See the show notes for specific content warnings. All right, Alex. So this week, my text is called, Have You Heard? Pete Buttigieg is Really Smart by Lisa Featherstone. This article is actually very well written. Uh, As always, I would recommend reading all the artifacts that we discuss on the show. Uh, The article is sort of about the way in which he is sort of thought of as being smart and sort of the implications of that. So it says, Pete Buttigieg, son of two professors, is a classic smart dude, a smart dude in uh, uppercase, and there is nothing journalists love more. He says he's all about bringing forward good ideas. Uh, it talks a lot about the upper professional managerial class, which it abbreviates as PMC throughout. It, it sort of portrays the upper professional managerial class as the people who praise uh, Mayor Pete, as as they say. Um, but it says, for them, all of life is an Ivy League application. Well-rounded smartness is everything, even in the wake of recent news, that this is not necessarily what elite college admissions are based upon. And that's, of course, referring to the college admission scandal, which is sort of what makes this article really perfect, is just the way in which it intersects this sort of cult around people who judge with the you know, simultaneous revelation that college admissions are basically a scam anyway. So it says, Pete Buttigieg has been the focus of a media frenzy despite polling far behind Sanders and Biden. Uh, the numbers have probably moved somewhat since this uh, article. article, but the point is that he is still behind a lot of people in the race, but still gets a lot of praise. So the middle section, there's a lot of good lines, and I won't quote the whole thing. But basically, it's talking about how one point is the way in which uh, Buttigieg sort of gets praised as being smart, despite the fact that there are other smart candidates in the race. You know, regardless of what you think about them, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Julian Castro, Cory Booker have similar credentials as uh, Buttigieg. But the, but the larger point is uh, this part, which I will quote from. The question of what smart even means and why this type of smart should matter in a presidential race got less attention um, than the fact that uh, Buttigieg is quote-unquote smart. Um, One person rightly asked, are you sure he's not just smart in the ways you also fancy yourself to be smart? No one asked why this particular form of well-credentialed smart should count for quite a lot. That's because while the PMC are often eager to be more inclusive about who gets to be smart, women, black people, they have tremendous faith in the concept itself. And then skipping down a little bit, the notion of smart allows elites to recast inequality as meritocracy. In this narrative, you're rich because you did well in high school and went to Princeton, not because capitalism has taken something from someone else and given it to you. It's trying, It's saying that there's a, a lot of emphasis on trying to be inclusive about who gets to be smart and again smartness here is basically as credentialing from various uh you know university type institutions uh, but no question of like whether or not that actually is valuable particularly in a politician and then another line layer down smartness to them makes some people more deserving of the good life than others uh, smartness culture is social darwinism for liberals then the article sort of goes on to say, you know, a lot of the politics that you maybe will agree with from Buttigieg are the same policies that you find in other candidates anyway. Even like his, his most left positions are positions that Bernie Sanders also holds, and his positions that aren't as left, uh, for example, that it says capitalism can be good while government regulation can be bad, uh, you can find in anyone else not named Bernie Sanders. And then the article ends, I'll just quote the end. Smart is not going to save us, and fetishizing its most conventional manifestation shores up bourgeois ideology 
and undermines the genuinely emancipatory politics of collective action. Bernie Sanders, instead of showing off his University of Chicago education, touts the power of the masses. Quote, not me, us, unquote. The cult of the smart dude leads us into just the opposite place, which is probably why some liberals like it so much. So that's the article, but I just like the way that it sort of calls out um, this particular form of smartness, which again is really just being able to put on a resume that you went to some sort of Ivy League institution uh, and the ways that that's not necessarily of value if we're thinking about the ways in which we actually want to go about enacting political change. So this article actually is very is similar to another article in Jacobin called Politics is Not Harry Potter, which I almost <laughs> covered on the show a different week, except I don't watch Harry Potter or read the book, so I didn't, wasn't really qualified to talk about it. But if you think about, even just generally, if you think about Harry Potter, it's sort of the way the whole point is that whoever is best in school becomes the most powerful and is the good guy. Kind of, and that's why you see so many sort of like centrist liberals sort of tend to be the people who like Harry Potter. Because it also sort of fits the same mold of, well, if you did really well in school, then obviously you should get to rule over everyone. So this article does a good job sort of like outlining that sort of ideology. Well, I don't give a shit about Harry Potter, so I really like that take also. <laughs> um, every college seems like it's about as much as you get out of it, and just going to Harvard doesn't mean that you're smart, or graduating from Harvard doesn't mean that you're smart, it just means that you knew somebody that got you into Harvard. So that was the first thing, and yeah, I like that they referenced that and then said, like, listen, this is not, like, this is not nearly as impressive as anybody, like, anybody wants you to think it is. Like, the only people that are really trying to, like, let you know how good an Ivy League school is are people that either people that are trying to get you to go to an Ivy League school or people that went to an Ivy League school. Mm -hmm. One thing, oh, and the other thing that I liked about this, I mean, they talk about how, like, the culture of smart and, like, most of the detritus... Detritus? Is that how you say that? Detritus? I'm, you act like I've, I've never heard that word before <laughs> in my life. What is that? Det what does detritus even mean? Uh, I think it's, like, context. trash, basically. Okay, so... Um, the quote is, it's oddly uh, banal, the culture of smart, like most of the detritus of smartness culture from Freakonomics to TED Talks to NPR, boot edge edge is politically underwhelming. Um, and that sort of reminds me of also the idea of like class and like doing things like with class and like operating like with like this, which is like sort of especially deeply rooted in like Southern culture and how like things like this, like again like the article references like you got there because uh, like something was taken from somebody else like <laughs> the southerners and like just like rich people can like focus so much on class because they don't have to worry about working because there is either a literal like slave doing all the work for them or just like somebody else is like paying for their like life with either their taxes or some other shit and so like it's a useless like class and like this type of smartness are useless things to f like focus on for anybody that isn't for anybody that has anything better to do than talk about having gone to Oxford or Yale or Harvard, but just something that like not even rub me, like kind of rub me the wrong way uh, was when they were talking, they took like some shots at Beto. I'm not a Beto fan. I'm not a, I don't know. What is Beto? <laughs> Beto's boy. Does he have a thing? Like what is his fan base called? Uh... I I don't know I don't know of any name for his fan base mostly because I think they are disappeared now. But um, but uh, they say like Beto was sort of in the same boat uh, after some initial sense of promise. He now <laughs> revealed himself to be a dummy who has to ask his wife on the proper uses of subconscious. Hence the boot edge edge mania. Brother, if every single one of us hasn't asked somebody else like how to use a, a, a very common word in a sentence, like maybe you should do it on TV when you're a presidential candidate. But if we're gonna hold that person to every standard, like do not go through my Google history of trying to figure out like what a very common word definition is. Like I will not, I will not stand for this attack. Um, but other uh, than that, I mean that's that wasn't even like again that's not even like a criticism, but that was just something that like stuck out to me. Like hey, me too. Let me, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think. Um... I think this article really gets driven home if you take a trip to uh, Buttigieg's uh, uh, campaign page, uh, where because I mean I like the what the line about he says he's all about quote bringing good idea uh, bringing forward good ideas 
because I was I was on his uh, campaign page earlier today, and yeah, there's really I mean the critique of Boy Judge is that he has no specifics at all, and honestly, um, even since his article came out, I think some of the Boy Judge uh, mania has also died down a little bit when people sort of have seen his emptiness, but. Uh, uh, my, one of my favorite lines from his campaign page was, quote, uh, it says he, one of his visions is, quote, everyone has the chance to find purpose and belonging in our economy and our country, unquote. I know what maybe is trying to say, but what, I don't know, what does it mean to find, to say that everyone will find purpose and belonging in the economy? Like I don't is I don't know is working a minimum wage job at McDonald's finding purpose and belonging. I'm not probably for exactly him. Sure. Like I just, <laughs> like it's probably what he meant. Like I just don't like you. Just didn't have to. You just didn't even have to add those words. Like I know like that's his <laughs> thing, but like, you just didn't have to, brother. But that's like the whole site. It, everything is just about. And he brags a lot about that he went to Harvard and Oxford. Of course he uh, does. The the end of the site just ends with a video of him saying that he has experience although he doesn't say experience what he do has done with his experience point is if you go to his website uh hopefully the 2020 election hasn't ended by the time this goes up but if you go to his website you'll see uh it's no longer see... fair <laughs> just spiteful <laughs> Uh, if you go to his website, you'll see uh, that this article really does a good job of sort of highlighting some of that. I don't think he has a chance of winning. No, it's I. But yeah, I feel like there's a lot of people who I feel like don't have a chance of winning, but one of them's going to come close. It could oh, yeah. be him. There is, there's definitely a hype train around Buddha Judge still. Mm -hmm. um, it's only 2019. But yeah, it's just just this sort of like idea that these people have that there's like nothing more to life than school mm -hmm. um yeah i wanted to make i wanted to go back to the social darwinism for liberals point which i think is a good line uh just because i think a lot of times we sort of associate social darwinism with a more conservative mindset that basically that whoever has the most money should get to rule over everyone um but i think this sort of highlights the way in which a certain type of centrist liberal has adopted that same thinking, but has just replaced money with this sort of like credentialing. Oh, also the point about uh, uh, academics sort of just gathering in a room to solve problems. If you've ever been to an academic conference, uh, it is sort of a shame that you have dozens to hundreds of people all in a hotel room, all talking about change, and they never actually leave the hotel room to go out into the city yeah and then i just like to the last thing i'll say about this article i just like the ending uh but the real problem is by not everyone can go to an ivy league school and so uh by sort of holding that up on a pedestal it, it does sort of impede uh any sort of attempts at uh you know collective action as it says so we have to find other sort of broader things to organize around than this cult cult of smartness. So, all right, yeah. So that's all I have to say about that one. Uh, so, what's your artifact this week, Alex? My artifact is um, a video from the Bloomberg YouTube channel uh, called "How Norway Reinvented Prison." Um, and it's talking about it compares directly with like compares makes direct comparisons to the american um prison system but talks a lot about how um how different it is with how norway does it and the way that they've um adapted and updated in their uh far superior uh prison system i guess that's theoretically that's up for opinion but it really truly does not seem to be that way um but i guess if you're focused on just retribution for the reason for putting people in prison then i guess you wouldn't agree with the norwegian style but anyway the artifacts the video focuses um broadly on the norwegian prison system in general but uh 
uses the Halden prison, maximum security prison, as um, its sort of concrete example, um, which is a maximum security prison, as I said, which contains 251 of the country's worst criminals, uh, including, you know, rapists, murderers, pedophiles, um, people of that ilk. Um, and they talk about how uh, Norway's prisons have the low, Norway um, has the lowest recidivism rate in Scandinavia, 20%, which is one of the lowest in the world. And its two-year recidivism rate is the lowest in the world while at uh, maintaining 20%, while America's is one of the highest at 36%, um, going on to say that within five years, 75% of felons in America will be rearrested. Um, so very, very, very high recidivism rate. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that that um, will differentiate between them and Norway. Sort of broadly is the fundamental difference of what a prison should be. No, so some big differences is Norway as a country banned capital punishment in 1905, where we still have uh, a number of states that have capital punishment. Um, and they did away with life sentences in 1985. Um, not wholly, but um, sort of a default life sentence, I guess. Um, but people can still be sentenced to jail for the rest of their lives through um, the new standard, which is the maximum sentencing is 21 years. Um, but then at the end of that, um, prisoners um, can have an extra five years uh, increments added indefinitely to their sentence if they haven't been shown to be rehabilitated. Um, and they say, they use a specific example of um, a prisoner they have now who um, killed approximately 70 people in one of the sort of deadliest terrorist attacks in the country, in the world, excuse me, um, in their country. And he's still only serving, you know, the 21 years, and I'm sure he'll be there. Hopefully he'll be there longer. But in, so in 2007, they took a big, the art, the video says they took a big um, focus shift on to what they call restorative justice that emphasizes rehabilitation and normality over punishment. So, um, Prisoners in Norway truly only lose their freedom through, you know, not being able to leave um, their incarceration, but they can garden their cook and tend to animals and they can take vocational practices such as me mechanic jobs is what they um, show in the, and so you can compare that with the 159,000 Americans currently serving life sentences. When prisoners are released in Norway, they are provided with housing, employment, health care, and addiction treatment, which is, you know, pretty much wholly unprecedented in the American system. And they talk about sort of the cost of all this, which, you know, is sort of going to be the big brouhaha that uh, skeptics or critics would bring up. And so Norway does spend three times as much on each prisoner uh, as America does, however, um, at $93,000 as opposed to the U.S.'s $31,000. But Norway only has 0.08% um, of their population behind bars, which translates to roughly 75 per 100,000. The U.S. has 0.7%, so almost 10 times as many. And so if the U.S. had the same incarceration percent as Norway, it could spend just as much as Norway and save $45 billion compared to the third of the money it spends now per person but with you know over almost 10 times as many people percentage wise um and that 45 billion is is like equivalent to the budget that the entire budget of homeland security for the year um if we stop just actively so aggressively incarcerating people you know we could have some more money around but that's i mean that's sort of the gist of the four and a half minute video yeah the one line that i thought was kind of strange in there, and I, I don't think this is intentional, but the line where it says the only thing they lose is their freedom. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's it? Just their freedom? Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah <laughs> no they, definitely, like, <laughs> they definitely undermine the actual, like, <laughs> philo philosophical, like, practical use of prison. <laughs> like, that's, like <laughs> at the end of the day, that is, like, the point. Like, about everything else, <laughs> like, that is why you are in jail. Yeah, I'd be curious how the 21 plus 5 in ad infinitum works in practice, like, how many people... Cause, I mean, it's, it's hard to it seem like there's no life sentences, but, I mean, you could very easily be in there forever if they just keep adding 5 on. 
Um, all they basically say is, I don't know, I'm even sure there is a number somewhere, but it just says in Norway, almost all prisoners are released, which is an, a number or a statistic. But uh, mm-hmm. And then it also skims over, it just sort of mentions that Anders Breivik, who is the uh, person who uh, murdered all the yeah, Muslims, so but they just sort of like mention that you know he also is uh, only subject to the twenty one plus five thing, and it doesn't really say whether or not that's a good or a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I don't know. Again, it sort of depends what your view of prison is and how long people deserve to stay in for what various crimes and whether or not they're actually going to add the five in, but. I don't know, I don't really have much to say about the video itself. The only thing I really have to say is, if, you, if uh, you're if you familiar with uh, Angela Davis at all, then you're familiar with the idea of uh, prison abolishment, which is just getting rid of prisons altogether. I think it's more um, aspirational than uh, a fully fleshed out idea. Yeah, it's, it's sort of, I think it's um, important to at least keep in mind that there's even another sort of level to thinking about prisons, which is just thinking about what if there were no prisons. I guess the big questions coming out of the video are just, you know, I think that sort of relates to it, but the the question is like, what is the role of prisons? Is this, I mean, I, I hesitate to say, is this good? Because it seems like too easy of a question the way it's set up, uh, just with the fact that obviously you don't want recidivism and so it achieves that but i'm sure there's probably still people who would be against this for various reasons and it also ties into the idea the the stupid debate people have been having of whether prisoners should get to vote which i'll sell yeah, that now yes no. prisoners should have the right to vote no i agree wholeheartedly and that was just sort of another like a ab- more abstract reason of why like to just talk like bring this up as a topic is that's you know apparently on some bullshit and like part of the presidential debate for one reason or another well for bad no one reason or another but all bad reasons like i agree that just the answer is <laughs> i'm glad you're putting it to bed for everybody that the answer is yes <laughs> justin but you're right but i'm not sure if everybody's gonna listen even though you said it was such authority <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think uh in the u.s there's uh people think that the point of prisons is punitive when i don't yeah i mean i guess if you firmly believe that i can't necessarily tell you why that's wrong i could tell you why i think it's wrong but if you i mean i know some people are just are very like they see life as like a very moral scale and that they are the arbiters of what is moral and not which i mean is kind of silly to me but but really prison should be rehabilitative uh ideally i think and yeah so this is sort of like a good example of something that can look more rehabilitative so i don't think you can necessarily be punitive and rehabilitative at the same time uh, i guess i'll say on the point of whether or not prison should just be done away with entirely. I, I think, like, ideally, there would be some way to actually do that, but every time I try and wrap my head around it, I still come back to... In some way, you would need to... There's some people that you might need to sort of at least give continuous supervision to the point where it basically becomes prison. So I'm not... Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't really know if you can get rid of prison as a concept, but you can definitely like change its function and its um, form. Um, but I'm not sure that there's... there's. I mean, it's kind of strange to say that there's some people that c- can't be let out into general society, uh, but I do think that there are some people that would cause harm to other people if let out into general society, that would need supervision. Right. And any way that you try and sort of do that is at least prison by another name. So, so point being that, yeah, I think the Norway system 
is perhaps a good balance between what we have and maybe what might be the most idealistic version of what we could have prisoners are people who started out with nothing or less than nothing and had to turn to alternative means to just try to like you know survive or do whatever they needed to do because they didn't really have other options like that's like a hell of a way to like make sure they aren't like repeat offenders and just have more productive members of society people that aren't inherently bad People that don't want to cause harm to themselves or other people that just like didn't have any options available or didn't think they had any of their options available and now they're given one. Just like we stop acting like prisoners are just like inherently evil people that need to be like shunned from society. Yeah. I think the other important thing to remember too is just that we sort of have this um assumption that all prisoners are or, or rather, if you're uh, proven guilty in court, then that means that you actually did it in reality. But, but there is always the chance that a prisoner is actually innocent. That you know they just were convicted for. I mean, it's just in the, at the end it is. I mean, it might might seem an obvious point because you you know the person who is sentencing you is called the judge, but it is a judgment. It's a human judgment. And it could be wrong. And so to sort of say, because, you know, either one person or 12 people or whatever uh, decide that you are guilty means that you deserve whatever punishment you get is not necessarily true either. So I think it's also important to, uh, when you think about how prisoners should be treated and whether or not they should be punished or whatever, uh, sometimes they didn't actually do it that's why the death penalty for sure for sure needs to be banned uh i'm surprised that it's still around honestly i think that'll yeah i think in uh uh in not too long people will look back and wonder how the death penalty could have ever been legal in 2019 yeah everybody just needs an opportunity to better themselves whether or not they'll take it or whether or not it'll be successful but it all starts with a safe room you know what i'm saying justin (laughs) this is the new bit by the way everybody is i'm gonna really try to get get that in there and then that's gonna be a quick hard transition so now you know Now that we're in the safe room, Alex, uh, what do you have on your mind this week? This week is that people need to stop acting like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and that uh, Game of Thrones, also the film or the television series at least, is part of nerd culture because it's not. It's just the like it is just like main very much mainstream pop culture. Um, this coming from uh, somebody originally tweeting uh, Endgame and the last season of Game of Thrones, specifically the Battle of Winterfell, for came out the same weekend that uh, Avengers came out. I was like, it's a great time to be a nerd. And somebody just like quoted that, like, yeah, the two most popular pieces of media in the last, like, decade. Great time to be a nerd. Like, it's not, it's not, you're not. I don't know, like, I don't even know, like, you're special, I guess? Like, I don't know what to use, but you're not part of any subgroup for liking either of these two pieces of, like, visual media because it made up over a billion dollars in a weekend. Like, you can't, there's half a million illegal streamers every week for Game of Thrones. Like, it's not, it's not a subclass. It's not niche. It's not. If you read all the Game of Thrones books, that's, I mean, that's still very popular, but that's a hell of a different thing. The numbers are a lot smaller. If you even read the comics now, that's you can't even have a claim to that because it's a lot smaller because like, you gotta kind of go out of your way for that shit but like just sitting in a theater it's not or watching it on like your television is not part of nerd culture and you're not special or individualized for doing it in any capacity you need to stop acting like anybody's <laughs> ruining anything for you or like invading like the nerd sphere or whatever the fuck yeah I never thought uh, capitalism would be able to uh, mass produce 
the nerd aesthetic in a way that people who have nothing to do with nerd culture would be claiming it. I understand that sort of like comic books historically have been considered nerdy for what it's worth, but that doesn't mean because you watch the Marvel movies that you are somehow part of that group now. I mean, like you said, I don't know. These are just movies made for mass consumption. There's, they're not nerd movies. Like, no one's be, like giving you a wedgie in the hallway because you watched Endgame. Like, it's just not happening. Yeah, I don't know. Some people will say that this happened because the people who used to be nerds are now like uh, running these companies or whatever. I guess by these companies, I mean the one company of Disney. Although, to be fair, uh, Disney doesn't make Game of Thrones, I don't think. All right. Yeah, there's definitely like a move where people who used to be nerds or thought they were nerds or whatever, which is also kind of a weird thing because everyone. Everyone, like, thinks that they were the unpopular kid for some reason, like, regardless of what they what their actual social status was. But in any case, you do see, like, a lot of these people come back and sort of, like, the revenge of the nerds sort of trope, which is bad for, for various reasons. It, it's usually very, it's, it, it's kind of, it's usually pretty sexist and all these other things, but, yeah, I don't know. I, but it's all sort of, like, culminates in this sort of weird space i don't know we could go we can go more into like ner- like what you're saying like why like everybody thinks that they were a nerd just because then you get to like have your cake and eat it too of like you weren't actually like didn't actually have any like social struggles in your immediate like age group when you were in school but now you like but you can say you did because like i don't know i don't even know why because you like had like internal anxiety but it didn't express itself in any like bad way or you weren't actually bullied yeah i mean I don't everyone know. just ha- is not everyone but a lot of people are just insecure and so they sort of assume that they never really go back and reflect on that they were just insecure they just think like oh no i really was like unpopular and everyone really did not like me but mm-hmm. it's like no, it's it's kind of like those, like, oh, you know, like, me and, like, 200 of my nerd friends, like, would go out to parties every now and then, but, like, I wasn't a cool kid or whatever, like. I dance weird. I'm such a fucking nerd. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. I mean, it's also probably, like, some of it, too, has to just do with the sort of way education has been standardized, so you can't really tell, like, before nerds, like, Nerd used to mean, like, that you were also smart, but now, like, everyone just gets, like, an A anyway, so you don't even really know, like, who's smart, so nerd kind of just has turned into... Nerds now, I would say, like, a nerd now is more likely to get, like, lower grades than someone who, like, would not be called a nerd. But, like, nerd, because things that used to be considered nerdy now, like, the culture of, like, nerd what is like what is nerdy should be things that like are ostracized so like nerd culture hasn't changed like its doctrine but like that's not like what fits like the definition anymore like the traditional definition of what a nerd is like if you read comics you're not a fucking nerd anymore like like, that's what people do Mm -hmm. like i don't know it's just like you got to like figure out like things that people still like would make fun of you for doing like maybe kids make fun of other kids for fucking reading comics like i don't know i'm not in middle school anymore (laughs) i don't know but people play fucking video games all the time and do fucking dumb like doing a fortnite dance is cool like what the fuck (laughs) like you're you're dope for like doing that fucking floss dance i can't i can't like i can't like reconcile these children with like how i grew up and it's like i'm not old like it's this like the culture shifts so quickly more is getting acceptable but like if you still like larp like live action role playing like that shit's still nerdy like i promise like it's still not okay like in like in like pulp like pop culture to do that yeah. but i there's not that much really true like as far as like traditional nerd yeah shit. i was wondering if maybe like dungeons and dragons or something i feel like i feel like older people like get into it a little bit more but i would suspect that if you were probably in, like, middle school or high school playing, yeah, you probably... I don't know. Yeah. I th- Yeah, I think that Dungeons & Dragons is, like... I think, like... I don't... Well, I don't know, because, I mean, I... Like, I'm in the Dungeons & Dragons culture, so I can't exactly say 
cleanly like how much it is or isn't but it seems like it's like gaining a lot more popularity like with the newest like edition that came out like it just seems like i don't know like a lot more people are doing it anyway justin what are you what is your safe room uh my safe room also is related to marvel but luckily on a different uh track okay so in, in honor of endgame i just want to uh Tell everyone briefly why uh, the MCU is actually fascist. Oh, shit. Uh, so my uh, first example uh, is Black Panther. Uh, so for, uh, first you should note that the movie is called Black Panther. And yet in the movie, the good guys are the CIA. <laughs> and the movie ends with a, uh, a white CIA officer shooting down a ship carrying weapons to uh, help lead a black liberation movement. And uh, that is what we are meant to cheer. Holy and uh, I haven't seen the movie. Holy the, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also the movie's solution to colonialism is uh, obviously not to, uh, any sort of uh, liberation movement. That would be a little bit too radical. But instead, uh, it's building community centers. Uh, so if you just uh, build community centers, you can uh, solve, uh, you know, a, a thousand years of uh, colonialism. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, number two, Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, in the movie, we see the vulture. Uh, his main complaint is that uh, society is corrupt. Uh, the rich always end up on top. The poor always get screwed over. And uh, he's poor himself. And so he... Uh, takes advantage of this rare opportunity to use this alien technology to sell weapons, to make some money, to keep his family uh, alive. And uh, Spider-Man says, no, uh, that's not okay. Uh, and, and what Spider-Man's, uh, you know, to be specific, Spider-Man's not saying that what's not okay is society. No, he's saying what's not okay is the vulture trying to uh, survive in society. Uh, so he uh, uses his powers to uh, stop the vulture from uh, helping his family. And, uh, you know, the movie ends with the vulture being arrested and uh, everything continues on as it was before uh, with no change in the world. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so the, the vulture is uh, the bad guy for trying to uh, get money for his family and, uh, you know, uh, survive in the system. And then finally we uh, end with Infinity War. Uh, so you have a, a character named Thanos who wants to make the universe a better place. Uh, you know, he recognizes that there are problems with uh, people not having enough food or places to live. And so he gets uh, these uh, Infinity Stones, which literally give him the power to change reality <laughs> itself. And uh, rather than give people food and homes, he decides to kill uh, half the people in the universe uh, and just commit mass genocide uh, rather than uh, helping anyone. Uh, to be fair, uh, Thanos is the bad guy in that movie. Mm -hmm. However, he's not the bad guy because he did not help anyone, but rather that he's the bad guy uh, for trying to do something at all, uh, when the correct solution obviously was to do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I, to be fair, I haven't seen Endgame, and uh, hopefully I will not see Endgame. Uh, <laughs> God, so, you know, God willing, I will never see Endgame. <laughs> I have seen homecoming and to that i will say you know they do the thing where it's like oh you know tragic backstory for villain so that he's sympathetic but they really overcommit because holy shit am i like <laughs> are we on the vulture side the whole goddamn time <laughs> and it's not like oh he can't he's selling this, these weapons he's like the bad guy and like otherwise these weapons like nothing would be touched at all because no it's instead he puts he gets he does all the proper paperwork in the bureaucracy rents out all the necessary tools to clean up after the destruction caused by the avengers in the first film and then out of nowhere tony stark swoops in and says no actually i'm doing all this and he's left uh to go fuck himself with all the debt he's occurred anticipating that he will be able to fulfill the uh bid that he bought to clean the wreckage and so tony stark but like is but and he's at no point is he cast in a bad light at all in the film except for some faceless goons coming in to say like not by goons i mean lawyers saying you're not you can't use this site it's tony lawyers stark are like, goons all right well <laughs> that feels personal <laughs>
Um, but yeah, so yeah, and he's entirely the bad guy the whole time, even though Tony Stark was theoretically doing the same thing. Yeah, but Tony Stark is also a poor, struggling person, right? I thought he was the richest person in the world, but I guess. Oh, maybe oh I, yeah, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> maybe I misread that. Uh, and, I, yeah. I think you're right about that. I think the Vulture was the hero of that film. Yeah, you know, honestly, I forgot that uh, they put Elon Musk slash Tony Stark as the uh, hero of that movie as well. Yeah, yeah. The Vulture's complaints literally that the rich screw over the poor, and then a rich person comes in to screw him over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tony Stark was born with a silver spoon in every single orifice. But honestly, like the the movie like says that he's rich, but if you look he's at his house, <laughs> he, yeah, he's in like a two bedroom like yeah, he's three fine. three bathroom house, and they're like, this is a mansion. And it's like it's a nice house, but it's not a mansion. No, like, he's, he's comfortable. Yeah. He's able to afford. <laughs> He still has significantly less money than Tony Stark. Oh like, yeah, but for some reason, like we have to stop it. Like, and Tony Stark also has more powerful weapons than he has. Oh but, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like, like everything about the movie is just like yeah. Anyway, my critique of Marvel is just that they they really go out of their way to limit our ability to conceive what is possible, and basically. No matter how much power you have, uh, the only thing you can ever do is work within the system, and the only people who are bad are people who try and change the system. That's the message of every single Marvel movie, and it's fascist. The nerds are the fascists now. <laughs> but, but, but lest you forget... Um, oh, fuck. <laughs> That's uh, gotta stay let... in. <laughs> all right that's our show for this week uh see the show notes for a link to view the artifacts for yourself music for the podcast was produced by nicholas pizzuto rate us five stars on itunes tell a friend tell an enemy about the show and join us again in two weeks as we find two new texts to discuss hey justin yeah were there good people on both sides <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah no comment <laughs> oh perfect